So I'm a philosopher and a biologist a bit. The discussion on Wittgenstein was very interesting. He's uh, one of my favorite philosophers. Um, so I should be staring at that, not at this. OK, got it. Um, it's just that the, the arrow is here. OK. So what I'm going to talk about today, I thought, you know, I really I had many ideas about how, what to present at this symposium. And I saw the earlier speaker's work. And I thought, you know, he's going to do a very good job at sort of introducing the main themes of complexity. And um, he did, I mean, I was a little late, sorry, traffic. But um, what I saw was an excellent job at just introducing a lot of the themes. So I'm going to spring, a, I'm going to be a little more um, sort of sideways, come at the theme sideways. And you'll see what I mean. I'm kind of tying in some themes on complexity to my forthcoming book on maps, which is going to uh, appear next year with University of Chicago Press. The title is When Maps Become the World. And I'll say a little bit more during the talk about this. And I just thought it was very interesting to tie the theme of complexity to one of the chapters in my book, which is called Mapping Genetics. That's one of the chapters in the book. Um, OK. So the outline, and I know I have limited time, and I can see Daniel is a, mer a merciless and good. Uh, that's great. I appreciate that, and you should be merciless. Um, and I'm going to try to get through my talk. Um, th uh, the outline is three parts, three aspects of complexity, cartography, and the map analogy, and which is more a general presentation of my project in general in the book. The book is pretty broad ranging, sorry. And then the last um, part of my talk will be specifically on chapter seven, at least give you an idea of what I mean by mapping genetics. Three aspects of complexity. Again, well, yes, I should just get into it. Um, so I'm going to, these aren't meant to be mutually exclusive aspects of complexity at all. In fact, I think they're kind of part and parcel of what we do when we think of complex systems. But one overarching question I think is always there is what are the parts of a system? How do we take a whole and break it up into parts? Or how do we take what we think are of a bunch of parts and aggregate them into a whole? And how, do the, how does our, our um, framework of parts interact to make this whole? Um, so just this diagram is a wonderful diagram from a wonderful paper. If you haven't read it and you have any interest in complexity theory, you should go read it tonight. Um, it's by William Wimsatt, who was at the University of Chicago for many years, and it's called Complexity and Organization. In that paper, he talks about what I later took some of the ideas and developed them in a different way, what I like to call partitioning frames. They're kind of epistemological, but they're also ontological. A partitioning frame is a way to take a system or a proposed putative system and break it up into parts. It can be at different levels. It needn't be modular. It, needn't be, it can be a network system. They can be processual parts. They don't have to be like static objects. Um, and Wimsatt does some incredible work in this paper where he talks about um, decompositions. And what he notes is that often, not always, in the physical sciences, or I don't want to call them the sciences of simplicity, but perhaps not in the sciences of complexity, as it were, um, when you take like a rock, a granite rock, and you disaggregate it or look at its features under different perspectives, chemical composition, thermal, electrical conductivity, density, tensile strength, often you end up getting the same kinds of parts. Not always, but often. There's a lot of overlap between these different theoretical perspectives, as he also calls them. At least that's an argument that's somewhat plausible. Whereas in the biological sciences, say, if you look at anatomical organs, cell types, developmental fields, biochemical reactions, physiological systems, and he was very influenced by cybernetics, as a lot of people were in the 60s and 70s, um, you, you get these different decompositions under different theoretical perspectives. At least that's um, Wimsatt's basic argument in there. And since I think it's nice to always tie it back to maps somehow, um, when you, you can sort of idealize different country shapes and sort of develop a classification of different ways that countries, the geometries of countries. Um, people have cartographers, some, carto some kind of wild cartographers have thought a lot about this and what it would mean for classification 
and so these are like you can think of as parts of a larger system and I lost my cup can I borrow your cup yeah. for a minute this is a system yes or something it's a whole it's the map of the world um, but so I think there's question obviously there's questions about what are parts and what are the parts of a system and what is a system relatedly one way you can aggregate or put together these parts, but not the only way by any stretch, of course, is to use the resources, the conceptual, mathematical, intellectual, epistemological resources of network theory. I, th I take it that's familiar to many in the room, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time, given limited time, on different kinds of network topologies, random, scale-free, modular, hierarchical. Those are just some key citations for um, these different kinds of networks. Of course, a lot of the first positive proof um, that was used network, what, well, precursors to network theory or topology, was um, Euler's proof of the Seven Bridges of Königsberg, um, 1736. And so then you ask, what is the what of a network? What are the set of nodes and links? What are the relevant disciplines? Different disciplines use networks for different purposes. What is basically the morphology of a network? What is the physiology of a network? The morphology is kind of what is the static structure. The physiology is what is the functional or dynamic um, process. Or, uh, and maybe emer an emergence might fit in here. How do networks evolve and how do we individuate them? These are all questions we can ask if we choose to think of a system as a network, but I don't think we're obligated to use the resources of network theory by any stretch. Um, that's just one resource among many. I think, lastly, you know, philosophers love to talk about um, ontology versus epistemology versus values or ethics or something like that. And I think it's really important in all of this, if I may say, I mean, I think it's important to, when we think about networks, when we, th when we think about co complex systems, so many of the complex systems are either human constructed or anthropogenically influenced. And of course, the one that keeps me up at night quite literally, obviously, as many of us today, is just the whole Earth system and you know, what we're doing to it. Um, and so values becomes a really important aspect of this. And there are a lot of philosophical resources I can't even possibly, in a talk, go into details about many different philosophical discussions about ethics and values that are used sort of in general to think about science and then also how it might be used for complex systems. I can recommend very highly, and I will say a little bit more about um, this over here, uh, uh, I think a really wonderful book to, that brings up some of these aspects that's related to my, uh, my uh, topic of genetics is Evelyn Fox Keller's The Century of the Gene. And um, I'll say more about Helen Longin in a minute, who's here on Stanford in the philosophy department. Uh, I, I would recommend feminist philosophy of science, sort of in general, if for anyone interested <laughs> in ethical and value questions, um, not just complex theory, but just science in general. Uh, so if you haven't checked that out, you know, two really great uh, philosophers to check out um, the work of is Evelyn Fox Keller and Helen Longin. Okay. Um, the, uh, Carlos, Carlos, see, sí. um, in his talk, he talked a little bit, I mean, sorry, I didn't see the whole thing. I was caught in traffic on coming down from San Francisco. Um, he was talking about reductionism and yes, agreed that that's an absolutely essential question in many of these, um, debates. And there's kind of an atomism or a reduction, I might as well have put reductionism here, um, average, where we kind of focus on average, single, or major effects of whatever the parts are that we're looking at. And that's typically contrasted with holism, where there's kind of interactive and emergent effects. And then I put Descartes and Buddha here, because sort of, they're just meant to kind of be stand-ins of a more versus approach as compared to a more and approach. 
um, as shouldn't come as a surprise to many, I mean, a lot of Western philosophy obviously is built on making distinctions and making strong and mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive natural kinds and, and conceptual frameworks where each object is um, its own kind of thing and there's very little overlap. Wittgenstein, for example, was arguing against a lot of these kinds of biases. If, and, um, and then there, people like John Dewey, um, Ludwig Wittgenstein, um, I have to, uh, th those are two particularly that come to mind right now as wanting to overcome dualisms and wanting to say, well, it's both and. It's not either or. Um, another aspect that's important, of course, in complexity, we also heard about before, is this idea of monoperspectivalism versus plural, pluriperspectivalism. And, one reason I think uh, complexity sciences is so important and interesting is it really gets at trying to tie together um, different perspectives and different ways of cutting up a system and putting up like net um, or imagining it in terms of networks. There's too much to say. Um, <laughs> yes. And multiple perspectives. And multiple perspectives. Yes, indeed. <laughs> indeed. This is another wonderful paper, Gender Politics and the Theoretical Virtues, where Longino is building and um, taking a partial distance from Thomas Kuhn. Thomas Kuhn has a well-known paper in 77 where he talks about these theoretical virtues, things like accuracy, simplicity, breadth of scope. What Longino wants to emphasize in that paper is that there are other kinds of theoretical virtues that are also used in science, and I take these to be very closely related to complexity and to the com complex sciences. In particular, this idea she has, following many, and there's many since then, of ontological heterogeneity, meaning both that a single theory can have a very rich ontology with many objects, many predicates, many relations. It can also mean that there can be multiple perspectives, each perspective of which has or is associated with a particular ontology or a family of ontologies. Yeah, does that kind of make sense? If there's questions, let me know. Um, okay. And then, of course, she has complexity of interaction, applicability to human needs. Um, I think this is a very interesting and wonderful list. And she doesn't say it's opposed to or like we should all go and now only focus on feminist theoretical virtues. She says it's another list that we should also think about, but she's very much an and Buddha person in this case, okay, and in many cases. Okay. That marks the end of the first third of the talk. I'm making halfway good time. Is it 10.50 or 10.45? Okay, thank you. Okay, now I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes and imagine, and I mean this quite literally, just try it, close your eyes, think of a map that was around you, a world map that was around you when you were a kid or a student, young student somewhere, it was, might be in school, might have been at home, might have been at a friend's house. Think of that map, think of its shape, Think of the shape of the continents. Think of the colors. What language was it in? Where was it? How often did you look at it? Did you ever go up to it and um, you know, just be curious about where a certain country or a city was? Just do that for one minute. Try to just think of this. I'll do it too. Okay, thank you. So I'm gonna ask you, ask a few people, what map did you envision? Did you see, anyone? Oh, like a little map in the encyclopedia, oh, that's cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. I always get the globe, yes, yes, uh, yes. That he what, sorry? Tried to toss it as under the trash to put it out. <laughs> wow. 
Well, that's very metaphorical. Yes, OK. <laughs> Thank you for that. And there was one. No, I saw a hand here. Or did I see wrong? No. OK, hand over there. Yeah. Ah, the, that's interesting. I've never gotten that one before. A puzzle map. That's nice. Yes. The National Geographic Atlas of the World. Yes, the National Geographic Atlas of the World. Any other takers want to say something? These are, I, I, I love the burning <laughs> map of the world. That's too much. Um, <laughs> yes, the puzzle is great, too. Any other, like, very different? Okay, now t this might get a little... Uh, it's going to get technical, of course. What was the shape of the continents on these maps? Like, the burning map... Do you remember what projection it had? What was the shape? The old bad one that celebrated Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right, exactly. And in the Britannica, well, Britannica, so yeah, mm -hmm. probably, yes, yes, yes. Uh, um, how many of you saw this kind of map, world map? Do you remember the name of this one, this projection? Uh, Mercator. Mercator. Why? Why is it so famous? Why is it so used? Why is it like in everywhere? And why has it been everywhere since 1569 uh, or something like that? I have to think the exact date. Huh? Well, there's Euro narcissism. Yes, you can argue that. But why did the Europeans start using it? Hmm? Yeah, but why? Why did it work for them? What? That's true. It is. It does have that property that the straight lines. But what it's. But other lines. It has another property that other maps with straight lines doesn't have. I don't want to get too technical. Navigation. Straight lines on the Mercator map are bearings in the natural world. It's what's called a conformal map, meaning it saves angles, meaning you can use it. And you can just draw these straight lines, and that'll tell you exactly what compass bearing to follow. You don't have to make any kind of bending um, uh, fixing. So it became so popular to use in, yes, granted, the colonialist projects, no doubt. But there's a reason for it. It has a geometric property, and then it's been used ever since then. But as you probably also know, did any of you see any of these other um, projections. There's a gazillion, well, there's not a gazillion. There are many projections. The UN map, sorry, the UN logo or, um, and, and on, the, on, on its flag is what's called a polar azimuthal projection. The one in the middle, here I'm being a little naughty, it's the Peters projection, but turned upside down. Do you know what's special about the Peters projection as opposed to the Mercator? It preserves area. So the Peters projection, this guy, preserves area, as opposed to the Mercator, which has, the further away you get from the equator, it massively blows and balloons the area. Here, it's equal area, so it'll be, the, it, it kind of gets squished the further north you get, because you want to keep the, the, the you want to keep, can, um, Keep the area, so wait, sorry, I can't do this. Um, there's a thing called Tissot indicatrice, which are these circles you can put. The Tissot indicatrices are always circles on a Mercator, but they get huge and infinitely huge when you get to the poles. But they're circles. On a, on a Peters projection, these circles, they're always the same size, but they're either like this or like that, okay? But they're still the same size. Um, okay, so what, what, Mr. Winter, does any of this have to do with complexity? Any takers? Carlos, you should be able to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the map is not the territory. These maps are like scientific models. I'll get much more to that in a second. They're like different theories. And the world is massively complex. I, the globe one is always a, a, a tricky one. Even globes are actually interrupted maps because you end up printing. I mean, now with 3D printers, this screws up the explanation. But in the past, you would have to, you could print them on, on two, like a, a surface, and then you would cut it up, like into gores, like this. But now with 3D printers, I can't say that anymore. So, you know, is it a map? 
or is it the world? Well, does it distort? It distorts much less, granted, but the problem with globes is they can't get very big. You can't do very much with them because you'd have to be immense. And the bigger you are, then the less, the bigger they are, then the less useful they are. Yes? So that still saves the idea that um, you kind of always have to simplify, idealize, make certain trade offs when you are simplifying. You can't save area and angle and distance and shape in a map. You always, there's like, depends how you count, but there's anywhere from five to nine metric properties in a map, and you can only save some of them, a subset. Okay? So the world is complex, these models are much simpler. So, so in my book, and like, yeah, yeah, no, I have 20 more minutes. Um, I sort of, I do a lot of preliminary philosophical excavation. I openly admit from the first page, I am not the first person by any stretch to say any of this about how maps, a scientific theory is a map of the world. But what I think I have done is I've tied so many philosophers from Peirce through Wittgenstein, um, um, Carnap, uh, Kuhn, Feyerabend, Dewey, contemporaries Helen Longino, um, Bas van Frassen, Philip Kitcher, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, who all really make a, use the intuitive power of this kind of metaphor or analogy. I like to call it an analogy. Um, so I was initially, when I started just, you know, I've been reading these people for a long time um, as a philosophy of science is my core area, but it was just so fascinating to me how maps kept on just arising in so many different contexts in, in philosophy, contemporary, 20th century philosophy of science. Um, it's very interesting. There isn't much before the 19th century. I did do a fair, I went through, sorry, that's not true. Kant does it on occasion, but not very much. Anyway, there's, um, there's this set of discourses of the map analogy. And then I realized, well, but I have to go to the cartography and I have to go learn a bunch of cartography. I can't just write a, I, I think it'd be irresponsible to write a book on maps, how get maps get used in, in philosophy without going and learning a bunch of history of cartography. So the first chapter of my book is called Why Maps? question mark. And I just do sort of an introductory history and philosophy of cartography. Um, and then you also have to look at how maps, literal maps, get used in science. And so chapter six is called Mapping Ourselves. There I look at genes and, sorry, um, I look at brain maps and I look at migration maps. Chapter seven is called Mapping Genetics. Chapter eight is called um, The Cradle mapping space and it's all about like physics and math and geology and how maps get used and both literal maps but then also what I like to call analogical maps like in math we talk about maps and I tr trace out some cartographic sources for some of the important ideas of how um, the, the very concept of map gets introduced into mathematics at roughly around the 19th century okay and then um, sort of analytical fruits, um, the, well, one joke that I think is, is intuitive here is what do scientists and artists have in common? And this works um, in all directions. They both fall in love with their model. And so one worry I have throughout the book is what I call pernicious reification. What happens when you take your model too seriously and it becomes the world for you? And its ontology, which has been idealized all along, you now think, oh, wait, but that's how the world really is. And darn it, you competitor model, you just don't know what you're talking about. So I spend a lot of, a lot of energy in the book thinking about um, pernicious reification. Oh, oh, that screwed up, didn't it? Yeah, but. You know what I think? Uh, well, that's okay. I'll just use this one. Another, 
I sort of developed this very simple model, and that was, you know, it's too bad because that was a simple model, but something screwed up in the formatting, it's okay. Um, abstraction, concretization, and then we have representations and the world. And this is taken from, you know, the, the old scales of 10 um, video you may remember. Um, and then just, I go through what are different stages and different features of abstraction and concretization by looking at how cartographers have thought about map abstraction, what they call map generalization. And you know, before computers, there was, there was, it was really hard to draw good maps, right? I mean, and you were trained in it. <laughs> and you were trained in like, what are the different, um, what are the different practices of abstraction, such as simplifying, formalizing, um, exaggerating, like sometimes you just have to put like two highways pretty far apart, even though they're like right next to each other. I mean, like on the map, if, if that really corresponded to the world, they'd be like 10 miles apart, even if they're just like one mile apart or something. So you have to exaggerate, you have to symbolize. How do you decide which icons, which symbols, which um, to use on a map? There are methods for this, yeah? So, you know. At home, I have 20 textbooks of cartography, all the classic ones, and blah, blah, blah. So um, I, I sort of develop an account of abstraction, which actually is kind of useful for science, too. And it's not that different from some of the scientific um, methods of abstraction. And then concretization, it's the eternal worry I have about when do we generatively concretize versus when do we perniciously reify our map or our model or our theory. And um, in the, I guess, yeah, in the sciences of complexity, it's all the more, as it were, sinful <laughs> to, to concretize, or sorry, to perniciously reify a single model as if it were the entire world, given just how complex the world is. And so that's something I have to, I have to think more about. But, uh, ah. Well, I don't think I can do better than Emmanuel Derman and Paul Wilmot, who you may, pro may have heard of them or read them. Um, he was the chief research officer at Goldman Sachs right before the big crash in 2008. And he was writing memos to the higher level admin saying, you guys are crazy. We're selling products that have no foundation. And this thing is going to go on, up, on, up in fire. And they kind of ignored him. He had, he, I think he already had left. He's a very intelligent m person. He has a wonderful book called Models, Period, Behaving, Period, Badly. And the book has three sections. The first section is called Models. The second section is called Models Behaving. The last section is called Models Behaving Badly. It's really interesting. The guy is wacky, but totally interesting. Um, he so writes a lot about Spinoza. He loves Spinoza for some reason. Um, I'm not going to go into that today. They have what they call a modeler's Hippocratic Oath. And I'm just going to read it because I do think it's very interesting and relevant. I will remember that I didn't make the world, and it doesn't satisfy my equations. Though I will use models boldly to estimate value, I will not be overly impressed by mathematics. Yeah, yeah. I will never sacrifice reality for elegance without explaining why I have done so. Nor will I give the people who use my model false comfort about its accuracy. Instead, I will make explicit its assumptions and oversights. I understand that my work may have enormous effects on society and the economy, many of them beyond my comprehension. So this is from their so-called financial modelers manifesto. I couldn't have said it better. I mean, kind of in my book, is a, part of it is an exercise, one ongoing theme is an exercise in developing these themes. Okay. Right, so what happens when you're a kitty cat? <laughs> you look in the mirror and you think you're a lion. What happens when, like, you know, a limited model looks in the mirror and thinks it can do a lot more than it can probably do? What happens when you fall in love with your model? What happens when you make this highly idealized and abstracted and generalized world, step into it, and think that that's the whole world, until you start looking around and noticing there's no kitchen, there's no bathroom, where do I shower? Where do I eat? So these are kind of just visuals to motivate some of these themes, this theme of pernicious reification. Yeah, note to the wise, always do a power PDF of it. Yeah, I didn't think of that.
I'm, I'll be done in time. Okay. So in this, in this chapter, which admittedly is somewhat ambitious, but I think the book in general is kind of ambitious, um, for better or worse, or for better and worse, um, is uh, I sort of develop seven kinds of maps. Maybe what I should do is come back to that. I, I only list six, six here. I don't want to talk about the seventh today. Um, linear maps. Those are sort of the standard maps that we've kind of all learned and started with Thomas Hunt Morgan and his phenotypic breeding experiment, his and his groups. I think Bridges was much more important than Morgan, but Morgan gets all the credit. Um, is these linear maps where they were looking at breeding data, frequency data to make sort of a phenotypic correlational um, linear map. Then there's gene expression maps, which basically, oh, right, so let me just go through the whole thing. Partitioning frame, what are the explanatory aims? What is time and space for each of these maps? For linear maps, Morgan and Bridges, et cetera, look, and Muller looked at morphological or disease phenotypes, some kind of um, markers on the chromosomes. They looked obviously at salivary gland chromosomes. Today, you know, I mean, I don't need to go today to like all, you know, all the gazillion ways we have of like doing, um, doing these maps, you know, whether they're cute. Well, we still have kind of QTL analyses, at least in the 90s and, and, and teen, zeros, what do you say? Um, what do you say, zeros, teens? What do you say? Knots. Knots, knots, yes. knots or not? Knots? Right. Tell me later. Um, and then um, markers could be, uh, well, yeah, uh, and, and SNPs, uh, blah, blah, et cetera. And then you could also look at coded proteins to see where are the introns, where are the exons, et cetera. This is obviously a whole complex family of ways to do these linear maps. And the explanatory aims is to answer questions like where are genes located? Famous last words are going to be done. Where are genes located? How do they vary? Um, synchronic. New, and so time is like at one slice in time, how does the gene map look? Nucleotide and chromosomal space. Gene expression is looking at where, you know, where genes get activated, what part of the organism or what part of the superorganism, if you're working on ants, ant colonies or bee colonies. Um, I guess Deborah, Deborah's here. Hi, Deborah. <laughs> and and um, also Manfred Laubichler, who you may or may not know, over in Arizona, has some, and his collaborators also have interesting work on how genes get expressed in the superorganism in different individuals. So it needn't just be within an organism, and of course it can also be within a single celled organism. But the basic idea is to map out the active genes in space. So in cell and organism space. And I should also have said, and superorganism space and intracellular space. Next time. Um, and then developmental time. And the one basic question is, how does difference arise from sameness? Genotype phenotype map. Let me go back here. This is a very, fa very um, nice um, diagram from Lewinton 74's uh, well-known or deservedly, deserves to be more well-known book, um, The Genetic Basis of Evolutionary Change, where he talks about different laws of evolution. He breaks them into four kinds. It's not enough time to go over them. But he basically looks at how the genotype map gets, sorry, the genotype space gets mapped onto the phenotype space. And uh, maybe the most easy one is this guy here is development. T2 is like, how do you go from, um, no, that's not right. No, that's not right. Where's development? Oh, no, no, of course. That's the whole point. Development is going from genotype to phenotype, yes? I mean, that's sort of the genotype phenotype map is to give some account of how does development occur. And today, I take it um, a very useful tool for doing that are gene networks. So gene regulatory networks. People like Davidson, obviously, was important. Brittany was important. Um, just meant to mention two people. Um, there's plenty. Uh, how do, and here the question is, how does genotypic variation map onto phenotypic variation? Again, we have developmental time, and it's abstractly represented genotype and phenotype spaces. Another kind, I argue it's a map. I know I have to make an argument. Re, you can read the book to, for my argument. I, th I take it Sewell writes, et cetera's adaptive landscapes are maps. Um, because both because 
they're contours of a much more complicated set of gene interactions and developmental interactions and selection interactions out in nature that you are making an idealization of in your model and their contours, et cetera. It's interesting, a little biographical note, Sewell Wright, when he was in college for a summer, actually worked on a survey up in Wyoming, I think it was, and um, he learned mapping uh, protocols. And he, they were also on Native American First Peoples land, and he interacted with, maybe it was Dakota. I think it was the Dakotas. Um, but, you know, a little interesting side note, he was very fond of maps himself. I know that's not an argument, it's just a correlation, but, um, but I, I argue that adaptive landscapes are maps. What are you mapping? Genes, genotypes, or phenotypes, those are the partitioning frames, and you're mapping them onto fitness, right? Fitness is always the last dimension in an adaptive landscape. How can we explain and predict population changes due to selection is sort of the explanatory question. Time is evolutionary time and space are these dimensions which are abstractly represented genotype, phenotype, and fitness, okay? There's many kinds of adaptive landscapes. Comparative is when you're looking at different species. These, this is from a project called Yucca Maps, where they look at different species of eucalyptus, and they compare, like I'm sure some of you have seen some of these diagrams, they compare these rings which are different regions of the genome in different species. Each ring is like a species, and then they're just comparing the genome sequence. This is like, the, the partitioning frame is to do these cross-species linear maps, and in so doing, of course, you're evaluating similarity or homology across species. I know it's a lot of detail. Um, uh, and then the aims are how do gene locations and how does gene variation itself vary across species? And you care again about evolutionary time and nucleotide and chromosomal space. So it's the same linear maps, but you're doing it over time. Geographic maps are things like from Dobchansky's um, Genetics and the Origin of Species, went through various editions, but this is a famous one where like he looked at how different um, types of uh, gene chunks <laughs> in, in Drosophila vary geographically in northern Mexico and southern, southwestern and California, et cetera, US, okay? So these are just different frequencies of different types of um, gene segments. It's like part of the whole chromosome, okay? In, in fruit flies. So there's all these kinds of maps. Well, in the book, I developed this idea of an integration platform. It's not enough just to have this plurality. Well, I don't think it's enough. We have to think about how to domesticate or negotiate this plurality, this rich variety of kinds of ways of thinking of, um, thinking of uh, uh, say, genetics. The, the model that interests me is what I call th this model where um, there's kind of a conceptual unit which has to do with like the individual or the superorganism where you're looking at w what organizes this um, what organizes this integration platform is you care about the relations between G, P, and W, okay? Whether it's an individual or it's an organism. And so you're trying to tie together linear genetic maps, gene expression maps, gene phenotype maps, and adaptive landscapes in sort of a conceptual unit. I go into more detail. I don't have, unfortunately, time right now. And then further questions, these are causal. These are all causal claims. Further questions about like, how do these genetic maps vary across species or how do they vary across geography? Basically, it's time and space, right? Got it, yeah, I'll be done. Um, those are descriptive questions. I mean, you can make them causal questions if you then add like ecological factors or you care about selection versus genetic drift versus developmental constraints if you're Stephen Jay Gould or something in the phylogenetic questions. But the sort of model that I'm, the integration platform I'm developing with mapping genetics is that there's this kind of causal core 
to the maps. And then there are descriptive questions about evolutionary time and evolutionary space that you can appeal, you can draw on this conceptual unit for. And this is, from, this is the model from Britton and Davidson's well-known influential piece from 1969 where they first developed this gene regulatory network idea. And Setu. Yeah. Yeah. So we do have time for, for one or two quick questions. <coughs> I, uh, I I was. It's just it's recording. Oh, right. So I was a bit surprised um, in your history of maps that you didn't mention fiction and Borges' story about the one-to-one -one map. I do, sure. You do. Yes, it's in the book. Yes. There's so much, I mean, the, chapter two was just, it took so much. I mean, I look at analytic philosophy, I look at continental philosophy, I look at literature, and you know, there's a lot of footnotes, and, and you know, there's so much pruning that has to happen. It, it hurts sometimes what you have to take out, but Borges for sure is there, yeah, yeah. Yes. Correct, and that's in a footnote too. Yes. We have a lot to look forward. <laughs> yes. No, 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 because it's 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 very tricky. I mean, I, I, I it's true that the, the, we're past the age of paper maps and these easy analogies of 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 maps to theories, but I just think it, it's just it's birthing new kinds of analogies and new kinds of metaphors. But um, the book itself has to stop at some point, right? Yes. Let's thank Rasmus again. Yeah.